tonight, uh, I want to depart a little bit from my uh, venue. Uh, I was going to talk about the, the children tonight and the family. Uh, this past week, uh, I got to thinking uh, uh, about something that I think is very important to this congregation. Uh, you know, your, your evangelist John is, a, is very strong in apologetics. That's his strength. Uh, uh, creation, uh, Bible, science. Uh, he, he's been prepared from the time he was a little boy. Uh, I taught apologetics and Bible and science when I was in college at, uh, uh, at the uh, church in Ohio. Uh, the assembly there uh, in uh, uh, Lake Mount. And uh, he was only like uh, nine years old. And he'd come with his uh, notebook and his paper and pencils and and uh, all these adults were there, and he's sitting there studying along with them. And uh, he really got, uh, he, he acquired a great aptitude for apologetics. Apologetics is being able to give an answer, defending the faith, and uh, showing where Christianity is right, and, and it's the truth, and that uh, all other religions are false. <laughs> Basically, that's apologetics. And every one of you need to be able to do that. Every one of you should be able to defend your faith. If you can't, then... Uh, some bad things can happen. Uh, one thing, you'll be weak. One thing, you'll be embarrassed. Uh, you know, Paul said, study. Show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be what? What? A shame. Uh, yeah, he said that in his second letter. He said, you're going to be ashamed of yourself. Well, uh, how do you get ashamed of yourself? It's when you can't give an answer. When somebody said, this is what I believe, and it contradicts the Bible, and you're not able to say, here's what the Bible says. This is what, uh, what the truth is. And uh, there's a lot of subjects out there right now. You know, there's, uh, look at all the cults. There's uh, over, someone said, like 20,000 different denominations of Christianity. There's all kinds of uh, offbeat uh, isms and schisms <laughs> that you're going to encounter in your lifetime. So apologetics is being able to... Uh, uh, to deal with that. Uh, I'm also strong in that area. Uh, I've had people hate me for it. I've had people love me for it. Uh, people who uh, hate me for it, they just can't stand controversy. There's some people who can't stand controversy. They, they, they don't want to hear anything they hate it. And, uh, I mean, uh, they don't even want you to talk bad about the devil. <laughs> you know? Uh, and there's just something that's in their spirit that, that's kicked off when you when you when you talk about controversial issues. Uh, they just want to be able to take the way of least resistance and not have anything bother them. And if they feel like that they have to contend for something, it, it makes them uneasy. You know, it reminds me of the guy. He said, uh, uh, somebody said, "What are you for? What are you against?" He said, "Nothing." I'm, he said, I, 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 I'm not in forward, I'm not in reverse. He said, I'm in neutral all the time. He said, whichever way people push me, that's where I go. And uh, that's basically the way a lot of people are. They're neutral. <laughs> uh, they're not for anything, they're not against anything. And uh, Jesus said, I want you to be for me or against me. You know, he did say that. He said, I want you to be for me or against me. And he said, I want you to be hot or I want you to be cold. I don't want you to be lukewarm. He said, you read, I don't know what you believe. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a word that's called polemics. P-O-L-E-M-I-C-S. P-O-L-E-M-I-C-S. <clears throat> comes from the Greek word polemikos. It means warfare. And uh, Paul said, fight the good fight. Mm -hmm. He said that in the uh, Second Timothy letter. I have a time to give you all the verses. I'm going to give you a lot of references tonight, but and we're going to have a little open discussion. I want John to help me a little bit tonight. But he said, fight. And then he said, the good fight. Fight. A faith. So you're in a battle. Like it or not, You've got to take sides. You can't be neutral. You lose if you're neutral. You can't be against or you lose. You've got to be for. And you've got to know what you believe. You've got to be able to give a defense for it. A polemic 
and I'm set for a defense of the gospel. Now, across the board, there's a lot of subjects in the scripture. So I'm not talking about being uh, in, in politics all the time. I'm not talking about apologetics all the time. For instance, this morning, uh, the, the message uh, that uh, my associate minister preached was, uh, uh, was on uh, the woman who touched the garment of Jesus and was healed. And beautiful sermon. Uh, it was a character-building sermon. Uh, and then uh, there's subjects that range from how to pray. Uh, here I have a book here, Still Headed for Heaven, in the year 2011. That's, it, it's just a, a character-building theme on uh, how this could be the most successful year of your life. If you make your way to heaven in 2011, it's almost over with. And uh, I passed this out. Uh, and uh, it talks about the stewardship of your life and how you can make your life count in 2011. 2011 is a banner year for you guys because this is the year that you were born again. Uh, so, uh, I have a few of these left for those that may want them. Uh, this is light subject. It's, it's, it's like ice cream after you eat a good meal. <laughs> and a little cherry on top of it. Uh, and uh, so we have themes. Uh, in fact, I probably preach apologetics about 15% of the time. Uh, and I talk about uh, the Holy Spirit working in you. Uh, the, the joy of being a member of the body of Christ. There's a lot of things. But if you don't teach apologetics, for one thing, uh, over here in uh, 1 John, and in this introduction, I, I want to make it very clear that you understand where I'm coming from because uh, we don't hate anybody. We don't, uh, we're not mean. We're not uh, condemning anybody. But here's what he tells us that we have to do. Uh, when, when he tells us, that, Beloved, he says... Uh, uh, that you, you, you need to know the commandments of Christ. First John makes it very clear. And uh, here's what he says over here uh, in First John. Uh, uh, somebody read it for me. 4 verse 1. Somebody read it from the audience here. Beloved, do not, be, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out to the world. Woo! That's 2,000 years ago. And uh, we're not talking about people. What are we talking about? Spirits. Spirits. Everybody's got a spirit. And that spirit can be satanically, diabolically induced. And then you're going to have a reaction. Someone's going to get you. You can't live in this, long very, uh, in this world very long, but that some spirit is not going to get you. I don't care who you are. And, and, and so, how do you test the spirits and try these spirits? How do you prove them? How do you prove them? By the Word of God. Study to show yourself approved. Now, not only do you test the spirits, but he says over here uh, in the book of uh, Corinthians, uh, chapter 13, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, this is Bible, this is book, this is chapter, this is verse, this is what the Lord says. He says in verse 5, examine who? Yourselves. Yeah. Whether you're in the faith. Prove who? Huh? Who do you prove? Your own self. Know you not your own what? Yeah. Do you know if you're in the faith or not? What is the faith? He didn't say faith, did he? He didn't say there's more than one, did he? How many faiths do you have? Are you in it? you got to test it. Those that try to drag you away from it, then you've got to prove your own self. He said, how that Jesus Christ is in you except to be reprobates, I trust that you shall know we're not reprobates. Who's not reprobates? We are not reprobates, he said. Who's that? Come on now, who's that? Who's Paul talking about here? When an apostle talks about we, who's he talking about? Other apostles. Say the word apostolic. Say it again. Say it again. Apostolic. Say it again. 
It's not apostolic. It's not right. That's it. They're not reprobates. They were tried, tested, proven. They got the Holy Spirit. They were authentic. They were bona fide. They were New Covenant writers. And you can trust what an apostle says. And if a guy's not apostolic, throw the bomb out. That's right. Throw him out. He's not apostolic. That's how you test him. That's how you test him. So. Apostolic Christianity. Now, uh, the reason I'm dealing with this today is, is because when, when I first started teaching here, uh, there was a, uh, a group of uh, young men that came from uh, James Madison University uh, that were associated with the, the Boston Church of Christ. And then uh, later on, uh, they called it the uh, International Church of Christ. And uh, they came into my study and... Uh, I knew immediately they were not there to learn from me. I knew immediately. You could tell by the look on their face, and you could tell by the questions they asked. You could tell by their response after we got done teaching. They were not in that Bible study to learn anything. What do you think they were there for? I was thinking about that for a minute. I want you to look... Now, you people are New Covenant Christian, New, New Covenant Christians. You are apostolic Christians, okay? Now, do you think the devil enjoys seeing you be this way? You're free. You have a daring dependence now upon the Holy Spirit and not upon human contriving. Okay? You have a daring dependence upon the Holy Spirit and not human and ivory. There's not one person in here coercing you, forcing you, making you sit here tonight. There's not one person that's going to make you feel guilty if you don't come back on the next Lord's Day. Why? Why? Daring dependence upon what? Holy Spirit. Now, does a cult depend upon the Holy Spirit? A cult is man oriented, man centered, man controlled, and man organized. That's what a cult is. Now, if the Holy Spirit's in it, you'll know it. You can sit there with your Bibles open and you're going to know. Your spirit's going to know that you're feeding on the message of the Holy Spirit. You're going to know. But if you're in a cult, for one thing, the Bible's not going to be at the center of it. For instance, the Jehovah's Witnesses are a classic example of what a cult is. Does a Jehovah's Witness know their Bible? Now, you can't do this anymore because I did it to them three times and now it's spread all through their Jehovah's Witness denomination. Watch out for that Chuck Dowdy trick. I caught them on this. They came to my house and I said, before we even sit down and discuss anything, I want you to read from the book of Hezekiah chapter 7 verse 3. That will tell me who you are, where you came from, and what you're all about. They started looking for Hezekiah chapter 7 verse 3. They looked and they looked and they looked. Couldn't find it. They searched and searched and searched like Sherlock Holmes in the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They did their best to find it. And they could not find Hezekiah 7 verse 3. Finally they got frustrated. And uh, they went into their index of Bible books. And they said there's no book called Hezekiah. I said, I knew that when I told you to look for it. I said, it would tell me who you are, what you're all about, where you're coming from. You're coming into my house to teach me the Word of God, and you've never even read it enough to know that the book of Hezekiah is not in there. Boy, they exited quick. They ran up to... Uh, 
Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, where they had a Jehovah's Witness uh, uh, powwow, you know, where they would meet together and discuss all their problems. And they said, there's some guy down there in a little town of Rogers, Ohio, that played a big trick on us. The next time someone plays it, you're going to have to be careful. So you can't use it anymore on them. But there's other tricks you can learn, you know. <laughs> like the book of Asaph, chapter 4, verse 5. <laughs> they don't know their Bible. But boy, they sure know their watch their magazine, don't they? Yeah, that's right, that's right. Are you with me? There was a call. Okay. A Catholic asked them to read Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. They'll say, we've never even been to the Philippines. <laughs> you see... They have the catechisms, don't they? <coughs> but they don't have the Bible. Now, if you're going to have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, and the Holy Spirit's going to work through the Bible. When you were immersed into Christ, you were added to a spiritual kingdom. That's where you're at right now, in a spiritual kingdom. Okay? Let's take a look at it here, First Peter. If I make my introduction as clear as I can here, to tell you that I, 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 I really fear that that, you, that people can be pulled away from the truth by people who use human connivory to try to snatch them out of the arms of Jesus. And you can be snatched out of the arms of Jesus. You can be taken away by the connivory and the trickery Satan knows his Bible, and he knows how to twist it. And people who don't know their Bibles know just enough verses of Scripture to mess you up. So, uh, over here in the book of, uh, 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 of, uh, uh, of Peter here in chapter, uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, he says here uh, in verse uh, 4, He said, you've tasted of the Lord, and, and He's gracious. You have tasted of it. The grace, the mercy, the long-suffering, the blessing of the Lord that just overwhelms you. As long as I serve the Lord, He just overwhelms me even more and more. Verse 4, He said, you have come as unto a what? Living stone. A living stone, okay. It's disallowed, indeed, of men. Today, perhaps close to one billion people worldwide went to a cathedral and they saw the artistic skills and the statues and the gold and the silver and the, and, uh, the robes and the incense and the ringing of bells and uh, uh, they saw the uh, mass and all of its gorgeous beauty all appealing to the ascetic spirit of man. And that cathedral was filled, they said, with the presence of God. And they walked out. And they didn't know anything when they went in. And what did they know when they went out? Today, maybe another billion people went to a, a mosque, a minaret, some beautiful building with a gold dome and all kinds of ornaments, gadgets, all dedicated to their great gods. And people went in there and they bowed down. And they got back up again and they bowed down again. And ding, 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 they rang a bell. And, and they just went through all of this motion. And they came out and they said, we're just so filled with the Spirit. Of what? The three worship, <coughs> temple worship. Now, do you think they want to sit here and uh, have their minds filled with scripture? No, it says right here, you've come to a living stone. You don't need a cathedral. You don't need a temple. The opiate of Mormonism, temple worship, Salt Lake City, my audiologist, his daughter got married. He said, we have had nothing but grief in our family for three months as to where she's going to get married at. Should she go to Salt Lake City and get married in the, that great cathedral or go to Washington, D.C. and get married in that great cathedral? And they were really torn over it. Finally, they settled on Washington and a man got married and great pageantry. 
the opiate of their spirit is the artistic architecture of man-made structures called temples, cathedrals. And how many of these man-made structures does God dwell in? Where can you find God? In your body, brother. In the Holy Spirit in your body. There you go. Now, he said it's disallowed of man. In verse 4, right? Do these people want a living temple? Or do they want a dead temple? Right? They don't want a living temple. It's disallowed. There's more of them than there are of us. They don't want your living temple. Are you with me? Now here's what he is. Now he uses metaphors here because most people are temple worshipers. They're addicted to temple worshipers. Where I worship at with my people on the Lord's Day, I worship every day. I don't have to have a temple to worship, but we go there and take the Lord's Supper. Paul said you have a place to come together. You meet. It's nothing but a place. And uh, uh, the people who come there, uh, we got a nice building. They'll say, you have such a beautiful church. What an insult. You mean I'm ugly? Everyone in here is ugly? Church is beautiful? I had a woman I had a woman leave because I said, God can't dwell in a building like this. She said, Well, if God's not here, I'm not coming anymore. Oh, because I said God don't dwell in a place like this. God dwells in your temple. You are a holy temple. You are a living tabernacle. And God will not dwell any place else on earth except in your body by your permission. That's right. Amen. That's scripture, buddy. If your scripture teaches anything, that's scripture. Amen. Now, he said, you in verse 5, or what? What are you? You're living son. You're living son. What else are you? Where are, what else are you? A what? Spiritual house. A spiritual house. I thought he said, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, a spiritual house. That's, that's it, yeah. Holy priesthood. And you're a priesthood. You, you, my friend, are a priest of God. When I was thinking about going into the ministry, I was working on construction, and my dad made me go to the concrete block salesman, uh, and uh, he took me to a priest and said, Oh, if he's going into the ministry, he'd make a great priest. He'd make a wonderful priest. So, my dad says, you got to go talk to that guy. He wants you to be a priest. I said, okay. So I went in and talked to the priest. Priest sat down. Didn't have a Bible. I had my Bible in my hand. He said, what's that for? I said, well, that's what governs my life. He said, well, you aren't going to need that if you're a priest. He said, you've got to learn the catechisms, the mass. You've got to learn all that stuff. I said, well, I said, should I forget my Bible? He said, that would be a good idea. I said, well, the problem with you Catholics is you can't be born again. I said, you baptize babies, but I said, how can you be born again? He said, well, when it says born again, it's talking about a man in general. I said, no. I said, Nicodemus said, how can a man go into his mother's womb and be born again? He denied that. He's talking about a man being born again who's old enough to know what he's doing. Otherwise, he couldn't grow back into his mother's womb and be born again. The priest said to my friend who brought me, he said, it's a waste of time talking to this guy. <laughs> and he said, why? He said, because he knows too much Bible. He won't ever make a good priest. Now, when I walked out, I'll never forget this. The priest said, son? I said, yeah. He said, I know you're looking for truth. And he said, you will find it. That's what he told me. You will find it. The priest told me, you will find it. 
Now, you are a royal priesthood. You offer up spiritual sacrifices in, in chapter 2, verse 5, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, selected, elected, chosen, precious, and he that believes on him will never be confounded, right? You'll never be confused. Isn't it great to go through life and never be confused? You know that what you believe is right, what you believe is true, and you never have to make apologies. No regrets. You're going to heaven when you die. And you're on your way. And you're going to enjoy your trip to heaven in 2011 and even in 2012 if I can find something that will rhyme. No, I... <laughs> Over here. You're not going to hell in 2012. Okay, that'd be good. Okay. I just pulled that out of thin air. Okay. Now, this Boston Church of Christ group that came when I was teaching on Wednesday nights, uh, there were about five of them, and, and, and it was started by Chuck Lucas. Chuck Lucas started it in uh, uh, Gainesville, Florida, uh, and uh, he departed from the conventional <laughs> non-instrumental Church of Christ. Non-instrumental Church of Christ is a very cold, dead organization. Now, there are exceptions. They're much like us in many ways, but many of them believe that the Holy Spirit is just the Bible. There's no Holy Spirit in you, just in the Bible. Right there, that's the Holy Spirit right there. Okay? Many of them believe that. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, how are you going to walk with Christ? <laughs> and uh, Now, I know why they believe it, because there's a lot of people who believe they have the Holy Spirit, so they sing and they shout and they jump a pew and they roll on the ground and frog the mouth, and uh, they, they scream and holler and roll their eyes and get red-faced and their governor may stand out, and, uh, and uh, they say that's the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, It's amazing the things that people will blame the Holy Spirit for. And they're not intellectual. They're not biblical. They just kind of, whatever they feel, you know, they run off on a tangent and they say, Woo, the Holy Spirit's got me, you know. I did a congregation where they said, Catch the Holy Spirit. Like as if you're going to jump up and grab the Holy Spirit. So, I'm not making light of it. I'm just telling you that's the way a lot of people feel. Okay? Now, the non instrumental Church of Christ reacted to that and went the exact opposite by being low key. Pretty much conversational, and uh, there was no emotion at all. And they said, The Holy Spirit's in the Bible. That's it. He's not in you. Now, the Holy Spirit won't contradict the Bible because the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. So the Holy Spirit works through Scripture, no doubt about that. Holy Spirit's working on you right now in your mind while I'm reading you Scripture, teaching you Scripture. And the Holy Spirit works in you apart from Scripture in your everyday life, helping you to make decisions, helping you to pray, encouraging you, helping you to be built up. But the Holy Spirit does not contradict Scripture in you. That's the problem, see? Many people say the Holy Spirit told me to do this, the Holy Spirit told me to do that, and what they're doing is exactly contrary to Scripture, see? So the non instrumental people are wrong, and those who claim the Holy Spirit works apart from the Scripture are wrong. The Holy Spirit works both through Scripture in you, but not in contradiction of Scripture. Are you with me? The Holy Spirit will never lead you to do something to contradict it. Let me give you an example. Uh, just, just recently, I, I was coming home from a a wedding, and uh, my wife called me on the phone, and, and uh, uh, she said, you've got to go to the uh, Warren County Hospital real quick. You know. Stephanie was in a terrible accident. And uh, I said, okay. Uh, and then my wife began to cry. And uh, she said, her life was taken. 
So I chopped down on the gas pedal, kicked it into passenger gear. I've done this before. I got picked up by a state trooper one time. I said, you want to cite me? I said, I got a, a man dying in a hospital, and I got to be there before he dies. He said, go. But he followed me. He followed me all the way to the emergency room. Boy, if there wasn't a man in the hospital that knew I was coming, I was going to get a big, fat ticket. <laughs> but he actually escorted me. So if there's an emergency, they will help you. And I knew he would help me if I got picked up. But when I got there, there were several state troopers in the hospital parking lot. And I pulled in. And they were investigating the accident. She had a terrible motorcycle accident. And she actually ran right into a telephone pole with her boyfriend on the back and her face just struck the telephone pole full force. And as I walked from the lobby to the morgue area, uh, they said, you, you need to go in there and, and be with them. So we went in there and they had the body in the, the morgue. And I didn't want to look at her face. It, it was so torn up. But her hands were sticking out. And I want to tell you, it's so amazing that you can have a warm, soft body right now and have a cold, stiff body in five minutes. And that beautiful woman, one of the most beautiful women in our congregation, had her fingers manicured, her fingernails, the most beautiful manicures I've ever seen in my life. And her hands, her arms were perfect with just her face. It was messed up. And I knew her mom was going to go into a great emotional upheaval. And she just took hold of her daughter's hand, and I heard her saying things. I couldn't even tell what she was saying. I don't even think she knew what she was saying. But I really believe that the Holy Spirit was helping her to pray a prayer that was acceptable to God in a time of crisis like that. Let me read that. The Bible says the Holy Spirit aids you and comforts you. When you are at your wit's end, you are speechless. You can't even talk. The Holy Spirit helps you to think the proper thought. Now, isn't that wonderful? Those of you who are born again of the water, spirit, you have that. No matter what the crisis is you face, you have the Holy Spirit. And He is God in you. So, we have a daring dependence upon that. And Chuck Lucas came out of the Monastery of the Church of Christ. In 1967, he began to work with the Florida University students. And these students have a great void in their lives. So he began to disciple them. Now the word disciple sounds good, but this basically just means to teach. Jesus said, go in the world and teach all nations. Well, when you make the fancy word disciple, it's possible that you're looking for something other than than just teaching by the authority of Christ, okay? The authority of Christ, not my authority. Okay. Now, one of the things that Chuck Lucas did with these students was he'd get them to confess their sins. He'd take them right to James chapter 5. Here's where they go, right off the bat. Now, since some of them may be hearing me right now on this uh, website, and some of them know that in uh, my, my polemic that I'm saying this is where they go not to help you, but to enslave you. you got to be watchful, be careful here. First of all, teaching and discipling is very, very important. Every one of you ought to be disciples. So who is going to be the whipping post to spur you and get you to want to be a disciple? The Holy Spirit, remember? We have a daring dependence on the Holy Spirit that you guys are going to get what I'm saying. Daring dependence 
on the Holy Spirit, you're going to live a Christian life. You're going to feel guilty when you sin. I don't have to stand over you with a whip beating you, saying you've got to be back around the Lord's table next Lord's Day. You should be in prayer meeting. You ought to be out on the field working for Jesus. The Holy Spirit does that. Right? You know what he's talking about. You're a spiritual temple, spiritual house. I'm not going to do for you what the Holy Spirit can do for you. Do you think I could have comforted that woman when she held the hand of her dead daughter in that ward? Could I have comforted her? I could be there to assist, but I could never have done for her what the Holy Spirit did. And she's the first woman. She and her husband are the first people that I had a memorial service for their daughter after the funeral. I went to their home and see how you're doing. And we read scripture about where her daughter's at right now, according to scriptures. And I tell you, I walked out of that house and I felt like a million bucks because a burden was lifted off their back. They said it took two services to help us to understand why this happened. And this imperfect work. Now, here's James 5. It says here in verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual prayer of a righteous man available to Okay, now confess your faults. What the word does that mean, John? Confessing your faults. Trespasses, sins. Exactly. Come on over here and uh, share with me for a few minutes here. How can we enslave people by getting them to confess their faults? Mm-hmm. Well, this is written to Christians. Yeah. James mm-hmm. is written to Christians. Exactly. So, we're not asking people to... Uh, I suppose there was a time when John the Baptist made people bring the fruits of repentance and confess their sins. But on the day of Pentecost, Peter, they said, what must we do? He said, repent and be baptized. And so we're not talking about sins that are committed before our conversion. We're talking about our faults, our sins, our transgressions, one to another. These, these, are, these are the struggles and the sins that we are committing like Paul in Romans chapter 7. Romans 6, we've been separated from sin. But Romans 7 teaches that we haven't attained uh, to what we ought to be, the perfection. And Paul says, the things that I don't want to do, I do. And the things that I do, that I should do, I don't do. And he said, oh, wretched man that I am. And so, this is a picture of the encouragement the edification of a brother, one to another. But I don't think this is talking about, uh, and this is a willing, uh, this is not coercion. This is a person who goes to another brother for help. We're not talking about somebody who goes and tries to draw away disciples to themselves and take them in a private room, a man apart from his wife and a woman with a woman, and try to divulge all of their skeletons in the closet open them up, as they say, and do spiritual surgery on them. Because there is, an, there is an agency in the Bible that performs spiritual surgery upon us. And who's that? The Holy Spirit. In John, in John 16, verse 8 says that the Holy Spirit's job is to convict the world of sin. And the Bible is the sword or the, or the slaughter knife. We looked it up in the dictionary. It's a slaughter knife. It's a dagger. And the Word is the sword of the Spirit, and that's what pierces, and that's what pricks, and that's what cuts. And it cuts. It's powerful, it's living, it's active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and it cuts and separates the bone from the marrow, and it separates our soul from our spirit. Because it's the soul that gets in the way of our spiritual revival. Our, our coming to God and salvation. It's our soul, our personality, our will, our emotions. That's what gets in the way. But this isn't talking about going and trying to manipulate people <coughs> for blackmail. It, it reminds me of a Roman Catholic confession, what the Boston is trying to do. And using this verse out of context to try to have one person over another. Confess your trespasses one to another. One to another. Right. And now, Chuck Lucas, uh, when he started his work, uh, he found these students in Florida 
uh, who were empty, void, and they were having uh, problems with alcohol and sex. And, and sex always became a big thing uh, because most people had a problem with it. And so they would open up and start talking about their, their fantasies, their problems, their troubles, their, even before they were Christians and some who were not Christian. And what they were doing, if, if a person wants to bring these things up, that, that's something that, uh, that, that that's it, it, entirely upon them. But the Bible said we shouldn't even talk about things that we are ashamed of or things that we used to do that we don't do anymore. That's a no-no. Yeah. Ephesians uh, 5. Because that, that raises uh, uh, suggestive thoughts in your mind. Ephesians 5.12 says it's a disgrace. It's disgraceful. It's a shame, King James, to speak of the things which are done in secret. Okay, now, a cult, Jimmy Jones, I wrote a book on Jimmy Jones. What Jimmy Jones would do is he would put people in a room with each other and try to match them up and then have cameras. And he would take pictures of them. And then he'd say, I caught you. And then he would blackmail them and say, if you guys get me any trouble, if you leave this cult, I'm going to squeal on you. So actually they were using this over their heads by knowing sins from their lives. And then using that to manipulate and to keep them on board with their cult, you see. Now, James 5 is a great thing. I have, I've got three or four disciples that I disciple with. And they can bear their hearts, and they know it doesn't go any further. No eyebrow grave. It's good to have someone that you can trust like that. In fact, it'll help you overcome a fault because you know someone else is praying for you. And uh, uh, one guy, I'll call him on the phone when he goes on the road. How are you doing with this? Because he knows that you care enough, that you're sharing enough to help him through these troubled times. Now, over here, we have uh, a, a different menu. Uh, I, I, I punched in the uh, Chuck Lucas on the... Uh, now, would you believe that Chuck Lucas was forced to resign from the Crossroad Movement, that's what they called it, for pornography, for fornication, for adultery, and homosexuality. So here was a guy using people confessing their faults, and he was more guilty than anyone in the whole congregation. And the people of the congregation who were overseers knew that he was doing that. And finally he wrote a letter of resignation saying that uh, I've made some mistakes. That's all he said. Because the movement would have collapsed, because here's the way the movement was, was built upon this whole Boston Church of Christ International Christian Church now, Church of Christ. They split several times. It was built upon those who were world sector leaders. Okay, this is the top. And I got this out of the Wikipedia. Uh, I have it on, uh, uh, you can punch it. Just punch Chuck Lucas in on your computer. Or, or get McKean, punch it in. And then it'll, it'll spew out all the stuff they're going through. This is, the, this is the diagram. I couldn't print it because it was so black and uh, so dark. But over here, I have uh, the, 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 the pyramid. It gets a little bit like the Amway, you know? <laughs> Only the people at the top make any money, you know? Uh, so you have the world leader sector. Up here, in this little point, two elders. First of all, Gainesville, Gainesville Florida. But they said Gainesville's too small. They moved to Boston, so Boston became the headquarters. And two elders, two men up there, basically overseeing the whole flock. Then you have geographical sector leaders. That means that uh, these first three tiers are faith leaders. And then pillar church evangelists. And then you have congregational evangelists, church elders, regional leaders, zone leaders, house church leaders, disciples, rank and file members. Sounds like a union. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now this is the way it was set up. And it's still set up that way. But the people on the lower level began to complain, saying, you're frisking us for money. They said, we don't have any church buildings. So we don't have to put money into church buildings. But man, they were lining their pockets with money up here. You see, the money was all going to the headquarters. Uh, so, 
uh, they were also uh, blackmailing disciples. And, and some of the uh, uh, some of the complaints that we got was is that they were using uh, uh, force in their discipleship, uh, and uh, the world uh, uh, leaders announced the disintegration of their leadership group. Uh, with the suggestion that a new representative leadership uh, group should uh, have uh, local congregations. In other words, the leadership should be confined to the local congregations. Kit McKean just said on uh, uh, computers, that John told me, that what? Uh, just in a recent newsletter, he said autonomy is a sin. Yeah, local autonomy is a sin. He'd like to have uh, a hierarchical control. Uh, now, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, he didn't call them rank and file members, did he? He called them saints, which are at Philippi with the bishops, that's the elders, and the deacons. Now, what does he mean by that? That one little verse has a wealth of information in it. What does he mean there? Is that autonomy? Or is that an international Catholic church? Yeah. First of all, they're located, right? Where are they located at? All right, okay. In chapter 1, Philippians, verse 1 and verse 1. And who's there in that locality? Huh? Bond servants. Bond servants. Saints, right. That's you and me. And they have bishops and deacons. All right, now let's flip this thing over and show you the Christ model here. I've already told you that, that that Christ model is not a pyramid with men at the top. Over here in Ephesians 2, we have the model of Christ. You've read it many times. In fact, uh, the Ecclesia at Corinth, the Ecclesia at Ephesus, the Ecclesia at Rome, the Ecclesia at Philippi, the Ecclesia at Thessalonica, uh, the Ecclesia uh, in all of these cities had a Christological congregational kingdom. Messiah, Christ, he was the head of all of these organizations. So, he says in Ephesians, and by the way, Paul, in chapter 1, verse 1, he said, An apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints, which are at Ephesus. He doesn't even mention the bishops. He doesn't even mention the deacons here. But to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Every one of you are priests of God. It just so happens that you have an evangelist. You have pastors. You have teachers. But you're all equipped saints of God. Now, that's what he's saying in Ephesians 2 here. Let's look at this real quick here. He said in verse 19, that you're no more strangers, chapter 2, 19, and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. And you're of the household of God. That's the local ecclesia in the city of Ephesus. You're built upon the foundation. So here I have the foundation. And who are they? Christ and the apostles. The apostles, with an FJ, when I first started out. Yeah. Are we in the right brotherhood? Mm-hmm. We're apostolic, aren't we? Now, let me ask you a question. There's one Lord, one faith, and one immersion, right? Right? Right. Okay. Your immersion, performed by John, me, or any other apostolic preacher, based on Scripture, was that you were immersed in water, which meant you were washed in what? The blood of Christ. Okay. So you need to know that you're going to be washed in the blood of the Lamb, right? Okay. So you got that. Okay. Number two, sins are washed away. Okay. And you have a point of reference now, don't you? Before, you didn't have a point of reference. When were your sins washed away? You said, I don't know. So they must have bumped then because you don't know, right? But now you do know, okay? Now, in fact, uh, I wrote a book, We Must Remember Our Deliverance, 
And I've been trying to get it to Randy because Randy says, should people be rebaptized? Rebaptized. Well, there is a case where you should be rebaptized. There's only one baptism, but if you were not baptized, believing that the blood of Christ would wash away your sins, and if you would receive the Holy Spirit, you would be added to the kingdom of God. Then it's possible that you should be rebaptized. You may void the first baptism, but there's only one acceptable to God. But these people in the international brotherhood, they've been baptized three, four, five, sometimes six times. They have a baptism of discipleship because they don't have a baptism that is a valid baptism. Yeah, I never heard of a, I never heard of a baptism well, of it's discipleship. It's called a baptism of lordship sometimes too. But remember, you know, I had to debate a guy from Montana who believed that you were baptized into the glory. There's a lot of so he would rebaptize everybody. You better be careful when you've got guys that want to rebaptize you. Because if you've been baptized scripturally, right. apostolically, right. and someone else comes along and wants to rebaptize you, you have voided your, your, your valid baptism. Mm. Right? Broken the seal. Yeah, you've broken the seal. So I had to I had to, to get into uh, polemic seven in, in Ohio too. People said, "Don't do it, don't do it. It's not worth it." But I saw people being rebaptized by this guy who said, "You got to be baptized into the glory, then you'll receive perfection." Well, everybody wants perfection, right? I love to have perfection, wouldn't you? I get sick and tired of myself sometimes. Well, you are perfect. You actually are perfect in Philippians three. Uh, you you are perfect. I'm perfect in Christ, exactly. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm perfect in Christ, but but he believes is that when you when your body is put in the water of baptism, you receive the glory of heaven, and then you're knocked out of your sharks, he says. The word sharks means flesh. He says you put off the flesh, now you become perfect. Sinless. And you know how many sinless, yeah. Do you know how many people were sinless in his brotherhood? Just himself. Not one of them, because you know how I know they're not sinless? You know how I know? Because they're all dying. That's right. If you're dying, you're not sinless. Their wives know, too. Exactly. Their wives know that yeah. they're not So, dying. But what, it, what I'm saying is... <laughs> <laughs> but, but he had a, a, an immersion. And, and, and if I... And some of the people I immersed, he immersed. And I had to tell them all, you made valid... You, you, you invalidated the Acts 2.38 immersion by being immersed into his glory immersion, and now this immersion with this international congregation is that you're going to be immersed into lordship. What they mean by lordship is it's a little bit like Allah uh, and uh, uh, Islam. Submission. Be submissive. Be submissive. We're going to baptize you to make you submissive. Submissive to who? Them. Their headquarters in Boston. That's who you've got to be submissive to. Are you with me? We're going to disciple you, buddy. We're going to get you into James 5, buddy. And we're going to make you work and sweat. And then pretty soon the people start rebelling against it because they say, we're not free. Look, don't let anyone take your freedom to walk in the Spirit away. You don't need anybody but the Word of God. You don't need anybody but Jesus. And you need an evangelist who will hold forth the Word of life to build you up and not tear you down with it. Now, here's Christ at the head of this organization, okay? Apostles, doctors. So you've already got an apostolic baptism. 1 Corinthians 3.10 says, Take heed how you build, lest you build upon the wrong foundation. For he said, No other foundation can be laid than that which has been laid. That's right, that's right. So we only have one foundation. Now I have little digits here, like a, 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 a barometer. And here's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. 20, 20, 20. Okay? I got it all the way up to 21. What's that stand for? 21 centuries? That's right. 21 centuries? 21 centuries! She gets me to laugh, and I'll never go to sleep. It's like that Burton Barber shark. Okay. Now, here's the Apostles' Doctrine. We're building upon the Apostles' Doctrine. Christ is the cornerstone. The prophets, they are the, uh, the writers of the Scriptures and the speakers of the Scriptures. They were inspired. Now, we have evangelists here. We have uh, pastors, bishops, overseers. We have 
uh, teachers, and we have an equipped ministry of saints. It's a spiritual temple. It's a congregational kingdom in Rockingham County, in Harrisonburg, uh, in Winchester, wherever, that we establish these are congregational kingdoms, and Christ is the head. No pope, no man, no denominational headquarters. Not yet. Yeah. We're built up to Christ in the church of Are you with me? Now, if they immerse you into some other organization other than what you've been immersed into, you better beware. What are you going to do? There's nothing in the scripture that even deals with something like that. Now, if you were immersed into a denomination, by all means, be immersed properly. If you were immersed as an outward sign of an inward change, by all means, be immersed for forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. If you were immersed and you didn't understand you were going to receive the Holy Spirit, Paul says, well, what were you immersed for if you didn't understand you receiving the Holy Spirit? By all means, be re-immersed. If you were sprinkled as a baby, that's not baptism. Anyhow, be immersed. But once you're immersed for the right reason into the right movement, brothers and sisters, don't let some cult come along and try to rope you off and steal you away and take away your liberty and Christ. We give you liberty. You can believe whatever you want to believe. But we also give you unity in the Scriptures so that what you believe is based on the Word of God. All right, John, do you have anything else to say before we conclude this? Well, I've got a few scriptures I want to read. Okay. It reminds me of uh, this ecclesiastical hierarchy that you put on paper. It reminds me of what happened in the first centuries when uh, and Paul prophesied that the church would be corrupted. In Acts 20, verse 29, when he spoke to the Ephesian elders, he warned them. He said... Uh, Take heed, therefore, to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. He said, For I know this, that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after themselves. So, the first manipulative discipling movement began with the corruption of the church government and the bishopric. And of course, we know in history that there were five bishops fighting to be the CEO. They had Rome, Constantinople, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria. Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria in time began to wane in prestige. Finally, it was the two bishops at Rome and Constantinople vying for power to be the CEO of the Lord's Church. And the most ridiculous, foolish argument in the world is that the Pope is the head of the Church, according to Catholic Catechism. You know, it's funny because when you read the Catholic Catechism and they say that Jesus gave the keys to Peter, they can quote uh, Matthew 16. And in a footnote, it says Matthew 16, 16 through 19. But then when they say that the Pope is the head of the church, there's no scripture in the footnote. They have to quote canon law, canon dogma. Well, the Bishop of Rome won that fight. And I see Boston as being an analog. I see the word international as the word Catholic. What does the word Catholic mean? International. It means universal. International. And yet, it's overseen by two elders in Boston. And so Boston becomes the Rome. That becomes the headquarters. You have two overseers overseeing the whole shooting match. And they drew away disciples after themselves. That was one of the characteristics. And it could be that this Boston movement is simply the same. I, I, I was thinking about... It could be, it could very well be, that the spirit and of... Antichrist, the spirit of the mystery of iniquity, which corrupted the early church in the first century, the New Testament church in Jerusalem, it could be that the Boston movement has this same spirit that's corrupting the restoration movement here in the 20th century, the yeah. 21st century. Yeah, but they're falling apart right now. Uh, 
and there are people that, uh, if you read this Wikipedia outline on it, uh, there are people who are really complaining uh, about being forced to give their tithes and offerings to their regional, region, regional evangelists. Yeah. Uh, and they're forced to make confessions. Uh, they're really forced to have come up with so many baptisms a year. Yes. And uh, forced to do discipling. It, it's, it's not a daring dependence upon yeah. the Holy Spirit. Well, I had a it, 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 conniver. I had a Boston man, and, and, and so now some of their people are saying, "Let's get back to the Ephesians model, right? And have local assemblies, local autonomy." Uh, so there's there, there's there's about five different splits now, right? And of course, Kip McKean right now is basically a man without the head of these organizations doesn't even have a congregation. He's traveling around looking for people to try to start a new work. So it's a little bit like putting out fires. You put out a few fires, and then the fire spreads over here, you put out another fire, and they're right now in the middle just putting out fires everywhere that they've gone. Well, if my understanding is correct, his own eldership asked him to leave, and so he had to leave. He left. But uh, I noticed that the hierarchy, you know, Rome has its bishoprics and its diocese, and they have their sectors, they have their zone, their zone leaders. I understand they tried to plant a... Uh, uh, congregation in every city around the world, over 500,000 people. But I wanted to talk about, I just had a few scriptures I wanted to add. Uh, I had a Boston man, and I had a little bit of interaction out in Indianapolis. And uh, remember our old friend Les Davis? Yeah. Les Davis went out to Chicago, and there he volunteered himself and submitted himself. Remember uh, your old fishing buddy? And he went out to Chicago, and... Uh, he submitted to this uh, decipher. Well, Les is the kind of guy that would walk into your home and just kind of help himself and open the refrigerator and uh, get a Coke or a drink. Can you imagine his shock when he goes into his zone leader and opens up his refrigerator and there were two cases of beer and he really uh, called that zone leader on the carpet and really uh, uh, rebuked him severely because it fi we find out that these guys are so manipulative when it comes to this, your sexual sins, and yet these are the biggest wine drinkers and beer drinkers in the world, and uh, for them, putting the bottle to the neighbor's lips is, is not really a, a test of fellowship, and yet, going out and ex digging up people's skeletons in the closet to use over them is one of their chief criteria for discipleship. And somebody told me that they challenged the zone leader and said, you know, why are you uh, going so hard on one side of the bottle? Because Habakkuk 2.15 says that woe to the man who puts the bottle to his neighbor's lips. Habakkuk 2.15, woe to him who puts the bottle to his neighbor's lips, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. And so why aren't they consistent? But... What happens is, is that we're not allowed to dig up people's skeletons because God covers that in the watery grave of baptism. When David repented of his sin with Bathsheba, he said, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 103.12. Ephesians 5.12 says, It's disgraceful, it's a shame even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. And here's a powerful verse, Titus 1.15. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. In, in other words, why would you want to manipulate people and put bad seeds in their mind? To me, that's worse. To be able to dredge up dirt and put seeds in people's mind. And, but Titus 1.16 tells me why a person would do that. Do you know what it says? They profess to know God... But in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. So nothing is pure to these people, because their minds and consciences have been defiled. And so, it's kind of like, I don't know, uh, poor Sigmund Freud, the psychologist, the evolutionary humanist psychologist, he, he tried to interpret all of psychology in terms of sex. And somebody came along and invented the Freudian slip, and... What happens is, I think it's in the Bible. Wasn't there a passage in the Bible where the spirit of jealousy 
would call on a person. Yeah. And that was back in, uh, was that in Leviticus? Where that... Second Kings. Second Kings? Yeah. Where that a person thought his was committing adultery, and so because he was committing adultery, he was always suspicious oh, of his no. wife. No, that's Leviticus. Leviticus, yeah. yeah. It was the spirit of jealousy. Right. The very sin that the person was committing, he was suspecting everybody else of committing. Because yeah. he had the spirit of jealousy. It's, it's like the Freudian slip. Yeah. Because you're judging other people based on something unclean in your own head, and it comes out, and you can't even, we can't even relate to people right. as we should. But the pure, to the pure, all things are pure. In 2 Corinthians 5.16, it says, From now on, we recognize, we regard no one according to the flesh. I don't want to know about what a person did before they became a Christian. Because we don't regard one another according to the flesh. The very next verse says that, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. So we're new creations, and we've got to relate one to another as new creations. Now, did you want to end with the Galatians 2 4? Well, I want to, I want to make one little postscript before we close. The people that spied out, they came to spy out the liberty and put the church back under bondage? Well, they spied out the liberty, and, and, and you people have been exposed to uh, different people who have tried to take you away from your immersion your apostles' teachings, and unfortunately, uh, I've been deceived myself by people, and I apologize for that. I have been deceived. Uh, some of the Boston people deceived me. I wanted them to be right. I wanted them, in fact, I wanted to learn from them, thinking that they had something that I didn't know, but I found out that really they don't have the Holy Spirit, and, and the reason I believe that is it says, be not drunk with wine that is old wine. It's, it's got uh, excess in it. But he says, be you filled with the Holy Spirit. The non-instrumental people are wine drinkers, beer drinkers. Uh, when Chuck, Cindy, John, John Flood, and I, we went with a group of non-instrumental preachers to Russia, to Ukraine, and we preached when... Uh, Gorbachev invited uh, evangelists to come to, to Russia and to the former communist satellite nations, and we went there to preach. And all of them were alcoholic drinkers, every one of those preachers and elders and leaders. And so it came a time to have the Lord's Supper. And so they pulled out a bottle of wine, and they put it in front of them. I thought, this is unbelievable. I wasn't expecting this. And they actually were trying to get me to drink wine in the Lord's Supper. And I said, no, I said, it's fruit of the vine. Fruit of the vine. It's not wine. It's fresh wine. I said, alcoholic beverage was forbidden in the Passover. Right. Alcoholic beverage was forbidden for the Ezekiel spiritual priesthood. It was forbidden for John. It's forbidden for me. I don't need alcohol in my system because I have the Holy Spirit. But they don't have the Holy Spirit, obviously, because they believe the Holy Spirit is where? In a book. It's in a book. He's not in here. So how are you going to live a holy life without the Holy Spirit? And so they wanted me to drink one. I said, no. And then they told me this. They said, well, over here in Russia and Ukraine... Germany. And they have all this polluted water. They, they, their water is filthy. I took a bath and it's true, their water is filthy. If you think ours is filthy, well, you only, did you ever see the water come out of their spigots just over there? It's almost like a, a, a gorno. It's almost like a... a, a all right, don't hurt their feet. Yeah, it's potty. It's, don't it's, it's, don't it's, hurt their feet. I mean, it, it's worse than potty. It, it's terrible. The junk and garbage coming out of there. I mean, I would, I'd rather die than drink that stuff. So... The whole system is messed up. So they say we have to have wine because we can't drink anything else. I said, well, where does the wine come from? They said, from grapes. I said, do you have a food market around here? They said, yeah, there's food markets everywhere. I said, I'll be back. I went out. Fifteen minutes later, I came back with a cluster of grapes. 
I went over and put that custard of grapes, squeezed it into a cup, and I said, now I'm ready to take the Lord's Supper. And two other of the non-instrumental people were there. Were you there for that when I did that? Two other non I don't know what you went in, 1990 or 91? Okay, so uh, I think it was 91. It was. In St. Petersburg. Were you there when I, I did sir. that? Yeah, sir. Yeah, okay. So, so <laughs> two other people says, we never looked at it this way before. Can we pick some of your great juice? Yeah, and so two of those non-instrumental people who had never been taught the difference between old wine and new wine actually took the Lord's Supper with my fresh grape juice. And the other guys, they drank the hard liquor. And would you believe that that's exactly what the Roman church does when they have communion. It's all hard liquor. So there is a semblance between this international church of Christ and Catholicism in that regard. With the government, the confessional, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the alcohol. And the alcohol. Yeah. You want to wrap it up with a verse there? Well, uh, Galatians 2 4 says it, but it was because of false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. And I think the bondage is, is really taking us back into law. Paul said, where did you get the Holy Spirit? He told the Galatians. Did you get the Holy Spirit from the law or through the hearing of faith? And I think there's a lot of people today that would like to take us back into bondage. The bondage of uh, legalism. Uh, the bondage of thou shalt not. Taste not, touch not, handle not. It's all human opinion, human regulation. Right. right. You know, we really have two commandments in the Church of Christ, the law of Christ, and that's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right. And Paul said, whatsoever things are pure and lovely and of virtue and of good report, praiseworthy. You know, if anything has such as these. Think on these things. Right. One party shot. Then we can eat. Okay. We can have the supper. I want everybody to turn to 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9. And we've been talking about spiritual freedom. We've been talking about spiritual liberty. We've been talking about you all being saints and priests of God. You're free people. You have every bit of dignity, honor, and privileges that I, as a preacher of 50 years, have you may have more than I if you study more and pray more than I do. You all are wide open to expand your horizons beyond anything imaginable. But 1 Corinthians 8 verse 9 does give you a caution. Let's read it together. All of us together. I'm reading from the King James. I don't know what verse you're reading it from, but it might be about the same. Okay. 1 Corinthians 8 and here's what it says. I'm reading from verse 9. You have liberty, but take heed. Let's read it together. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Did you hear that? Take heed. You're free, yeah. But you're not free to hurt people and to be a stumbling block. Right. Cause people to stumble. You're not free to hurt anybody. You've got to be humble and you're free. Amen.